Good morning, church. Happy Father's Day for all those that are dads here. I have a little cartoon from the family circle to show you. Little girl Sally says to her mom, Daddy said he already has the best Father's Day gift of all. And it's not the hammock laying there. He's thinking about his children. That's the best Father's Day gift at all. Family, children coming together just to say how much they appreciate their dad. I have a father in Florida. He turned 93 this year. He's uh, right now finished teaching Sunday school that he does every Sunday. He teaches the class. Uh, He just loves God's word and loves teaching it. Uh, Probably because an hour difference, they're already home after service. So in case you're turned on, Dad, happy Father's Day. I'll call you later. A couple announcements I need to make. One, next Sunday is set up for VBS. If you have an opportunity to stay after or come back uh, to set up and change our whole facility into a new theme, uh, they, Angie would love you to help out with that. It's not too late to sign up your children for Vacation Bible School. It starts on Monday the 24th and goes through Friday the 28th, Um, and it's going to be a great time. I think there's already over 180 uh, students pre-registered, not showing up on the day, Monday, to register. So it's going to be a large group, and we have a lot of willing workers to help Angie out in that. Uh, Also, remember on the fifth Sunday of the month, whenever we have five Sundays, we are not having two services. We're having one service. And June 30th is this month. Two weeks from today is a fifth Sunday. We will meet at 930 all together in the gymnasium where we have a worship service together in the gym. So mark your calendars because I know some of you are going to forget about it and you'll be coming as I'm closing in prayer. 9.30 9.30 to 10.30. So you'll be arriving, right? Why is Bob done so soon? Well, because we started at 9.30. So make sure you mark it on your calendars to come at 9.30 um, next, uh, two Sundays from today. And then lastly, uh, last week we told you uh, at the end of the service that uh, we've lost our license exempt um, status for our Faith Early Learning Center preschool program. And uh, the clo- uh, the It's actually got to close after this coming Friday is the last day that our teachers will be working. And so unbeknownst to them, three weeks ago, they didn't know that God had different plans in store. So we need as a church, as a Faith Early Learning Center board, uh, as they meet together to discuss the future of the program, uh, how to become licensed again. That takes time. But our staff, uh, actually there are six of them, um, they're, as of Friday, will be the last time they, they are getting paid. And so we as a church want to give a love gift uh, to whatever vacation time they have left and all that, but we want to give a love gift for their service. They had a great year. They've had great years uh, of ministering to the little ones and to the parents and grandparents through the different programs that they have. And so let's be a loving church. And if you're able to give an extra gift, mark it down on a check for the FELC staff. And we want to present them with a love gift. Now we're in a series this summer called Abraham, the Man of Faith. In fact, if you're a child of Jesus Christ and you're a child of God, you have faith similar to Abraham's faith. Galatians and Romans is full of the fact that if you trust in Christ, you are part of the seed of Abraham. And so right now, we're going to focus in the book of Genesis on this man, Abraham, the Man of Faith. In chapter 11 of Hebrews, which is the faith chapter, it says, by faith, in verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, when God called him, he obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. Abram, Abraham was a man of faith. Now, before we get started looking at the scripture, would you join me in prayer? Lord, we come before you, and we are people of faith, men and women, boys and girls who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. They're people of faith in 
the Messiah in Jesus, the Christ. And so, Lord, as we look through the life of Abraham in this whole summer on this series, A Man of Faith, may we reflect about how does this apply to me and my daily walk. And so may the Holy Spirit of God show us clearly from your word this morning. We pray this in the great name of Jesus, who we've just sung about in his name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 13. If you don't have one, we provide one in the seat in front of you. Pull it out. Go to the first book of the Bible. That's Genesis to page 9, and you'll find Genesis chapter 13. The series started in Genesis chapter 12 with the Lord calling Abraham to go forth from your country, verse 1, from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And God made promises to Abraham, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, I'll make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curses you, I will curse. And in you, the fam- all the families of the earth will be blessed. In verse 4, Abraham obeyed. He went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot, his nephew, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. He took his wife Sarai and Lot, his nephew, all their possessions, and they left Haran for the land of Canaan. In verse 6, it says, Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the yoke of Moray, And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And so he, Abram, built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. That's the first altar that Abram built for sacrificing, burnt offerings to the Lord, saying, I belong to you, Lord. Verse 8, Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built a second altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And so he's in the land of Canaan and building an altar says, I am here to worship you, God. I'm here to worship you and I'm calling upon you as my God in the land of the Canaanites. And last week we saw that even though he's a man of faith, he stumbled when a severe famine came into the land. He left the land for Egypt He asked his wife, I want you to lie for me. You're a beautiful woman. I want you to tell people that when they see you that you're my sister. So it would go well for him. Well, it comes about in verse 14, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her in verse 15, praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into Pharaoh's house. But God intervened, struck Pharaoh in his house with plagues in verse 17. And so Pharaoh calls Abram in verse 18 and asks him, what have you done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your sister and you'd let me believe that she was not your wife? So I took her to be a wife. Here's your wife, take her and go. And they expelled him from the land. Even men of faith stumble. Today we're going to see that Abram, a man of faith, he separated from the rest of his family, from Lot. So in chapter 13, let's start reading. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, that means south country of Canaan. He and his wife and all that belonged to him and Lot, his nephew, with him. Now Abram was very rich in livestock in silver and gold. He went on his journey from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where, he had, where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. It appears Abram's getting back on track. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. And the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. 
And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling in the land. So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right, or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, which is Genesis 19. It was like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward, thus they separated it from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley, and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, exceedingly, and sinners against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which you see I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abraham moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. The man of faith separated. There's another test that comes upon Abram. Another test of faith arose for Abram. Abram encountered family strife. Now remember, Lot is Abram's closest kin in Canaan at this time. He's still got a brother that's living back in Ur of the Chaldeans. And his father up in Haran. But Lot went with Abram. And the text is telling us that they were both kind of wealthy. And that presented a problem. They both had flocks, herds, and tents. We're told that in verse 2, Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. And we're told that in verse 5, Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks, herds, and tents. They're both very rich. They both had these huge flocks of animals. And the text is really clear that the land could not sustain them while they dwelled together. It tells us that in verse 6, the land could not sustain them. It says there at the end of the verse 6, they were not able to remain together. Their possessions were so great that they couldn't live in the same area. Isn't it amazing how money and possessions within families causes problems? Oh, not our family. Every family. Money and possessions cause problems in families. And in verse 7, we see there was strife between the herdsmen of these two men. They're quarreling. Bethel is located in the hill country. And so there's not a lot of pasture land in the hills. You have to go down into the valleys. And the herdsmen are now fighting over who can have the pasture land. There's not a lot of wells in the area, so when they have to water their flock, they have to bring their flocks to these wells. Who goes first? And there was quarreling and fighting going on. And to make matters even worse, it tells us at the end of verse 7, the Canaanite and the Perizzites were dwelling then in the land. So not only do you have Abram and his tents and flocks and herds, and you have Lot with his tents and flocks and herds, you also have now the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelling there. Presumably they've got their own flocks as well. So do they need pasture land? Do they need to water are they watching the conflict as it's taking place among these two kinfolk? It 
Warren Wearsby brings out in his commentary that, you know, unbelievers love to watch believers fighting in the church. And he wrote, when Christians have disputes, it hurts the testimony of who? The Lord Jesus. And Paul, the apostle in the New Testament, stresses over and over again how important it is for people of the church to dwell in unity. In Colossians 3, chapter 3, verse 14, it says, after a bunch of lists, it goes beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Jesus gave the command of love, right? Right? This is a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, so that all men will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. So in the church, believers living together, loving one another is a testimony to the world. And yet we're a bad testimony when there's fighting and division within the church. Paul says, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. He wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, he was in prison at the moment. These are called the Paul, uh, prison epistles, Ephesians. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. You've been called to be followers of Jesus Christ. So with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Can you believe we have to tolerate one another? <laughs> yeah. We don't all think the same way. We don't all act the same way. And sometimes there, we, we irritate one another in the church. Can you believe that? Even the elders in the elders group can irritate one another? Doesn't happen, does it, Denny? Never. Anyway, showing tolerance in love. See, we need to be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Church should not be a free for all. They should be working together for the glory of one. Who's the one? It's Jesus. It's all about him. And Jesus even prayed in John 17. We call that the high priestly prayer he has with his disciples before he goes to the cross. And it says in John 17 verse 22, Jesus is praying, the glory which you, meaning God the Father, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, meaning the disciples, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you, Father, sent me and loved them, even as you have loved me. He's praying that in the church, in, with the believers, the followers of Jesus Christ, that we would be one, not have strife, not have conflict, but that we would have unity. And here's the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abram and their strife. And he said, let there not be strife. And then Abram he sought for a, a peaceful solution. Look at verse 8 again. Abram said to Lot, notice he initiates this conversation. Abram took on the role of being a peacemaker, initiating a meeting. And he says, please, let there be no strife. In verse 9, is not the whole land before you? Please, please separate from me. That word please in the Hebrew is a little two-letter word called na. It's a particle. It means please, or it means in the King James Version, I pray thee, I, I trust that you would do this. He speaks with kindness. It's a lot. And notice he appeals to the fact that they're brothers at the end of verse 8. Even though it's an uncle and a nephew, we're kin. Let there not be strife, for we are brothers. He's looking to bring peace into the family. 
And the verse 9 tells us how much Abram was generous. He gave his nephew first choice. He says to him, Is not the whole land before you in verse 9? Separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right. Or if to the right, then I will go to the left. Separate from me. The whole land's before you. Now remember, in Egypt, Abraham looked out for himself, right? (laughs) Hey, lie about you being my wife. Say you're my sister so it will go well with me. He was taking matters into his own hands. He was looking out for himself. But now he's acting very selflessly. You choose. Dr. Salehammer in his commentary says, by giving Lot the choice, he was actually giving the land that God gave to him away, which could have been disastrous. But Lot lifted up his eyes. He saw the valley of the Jordan. He saw that it was well watered everywhere. It was like the garden of the Lord, meaning like garden of Eden, meaning well watered. Like the land of Egypt where the Nile basin is, where the water comes into the Mediterranean, well watered. He saw a good land. Now I have a map. This is just The whole map, but you can't see very much. But up here is the Sea of Galilee, then the Jordan River comes down and empties into what's called the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea. And they're right now, right here at Bethel. It's in the hill country. You can notice that you can see the the terrain is, is all hilly. And so Lot's looking out, and he's looking this way, and he sees what's the Jordan River with these little wadis that come in. And this Jordan River that comes down, this is all well watered. My text calls that the valley. Some call it the plain. It's a Hebrew word called kikar, which means oval or disc. And so Lot lifts up his eyes. He sees this. And he says, if I've got to choose, I don't want to be around this hill country where there's hard to get pasture. I want pasture that's going to be well watered. And that's well watered. The next picture is uh, the circle, the disc, or the oval uh, circle of what Lot is looking at. It's called a kikar. He looks out and he sees that. It says, I want that area. And here's a picture that's taking of that valley. The Jordan River is flowing. And it's just fertile as you get to the north of where they call the Dead Sea. Jericho is up there in the top uh, left area. You can see the hill country that looks like clouds in the far distance. Well watered. I want that. And it says, he lifted up his eyes. He saw the valley of the Jordan. He saw the Kikar of the Jordan. And he chose the Kikar of the Jordan. We can learn a lot about his character right here. Think about this. He should have deferred to his uncle, right? Abram was the patriarch of the family. He was the elder statesman, so to speak. And he should have said, uh, hey, the, the land, Abram says, the land's before you. Choose. He says, no, no, uncle, you choose. And I'll go in the other direction. Without showing respect to the clan's leader, he chooses what is best for him. He chose chose what would make him even more prosperous, what would make him even richer. He chose the valley of the Jordan. This is too great an opportunity to pass up. If I choose that area, my flocks will increase. They'll be well fed. I'll get richer. 
And if you look at verse 11, it says in the middle, Lot journeyed eastward. When we're going through Genesis, every time somebody goes east, it's not a good thing, right? It means they're moving away from the presence of the Lord. He's going eastward, away from the presence of God. And he chose this land without even investigating who lives in that area. And what effect they might have on his family. For even though we haven't learned yet, we're going to find out that he had a wife and he had two daughters at this time. It tells us in verse 13, the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. It's very possible he already knew that. And yet he chose on the basis of, it doesn't matter what kind of people live there, that's the best place to be. It's going to make me rich. And the last thing we see in verse 12, at the end, Lot settled in the cities of the valley in that Kikar area and moved his tents as far as Sodom. In other words, he moved his tents near to Sodom. There's always something about people who are in the world who are rich, who are wealthy, who have power. That's attractive. And Lot found this attractive. And it's like he's holding off entering into Sodom because he knows the wickedness there, but I'm going to get as close to it as possible. I want to enjoy all the benefits of having this fertile area and becoming rich and sophisticated and possibly powerful. But I don't want to immerse myself into Sodom because they're wicked. And I think today that we are living in a world where we have riches all around us and our mindset is to try to become rich and still serve God. We want both, right? We want to have the best of everything, but we all still want to be faithful. Abram, he trusted God to give him the riches. Lot's going out of his, well, out of his way to make himself rich regardless of how it might affect his family in the future. He chose the valley. And as soon as he left, verse 14, the Lord speaks to Abram after Lot had separated from him. See, I think sometimes we forget that the covenant that God is making with Abram is for Abram. It isn't for Lot. It's for Abram. And now that he's chosen and he's gone his own way, now the Lord says to him, lift up your eyes and look. Abram received specific and enhanced promises. I say enhanced because we already have the promise in chapter 12, verse 7, which says, to your descendants I will give this land. And now he's going to expand on that. Once Lot is out of the way. And the Lord told Abram to lift up his eyes and look at the land. In verse 10, we have Lot. He lifted up his own eyes. Now the Lord's telling Abram, you lift up your eyes and look. From the place where you are, right now, from the area of Bethel, I want you to look. Northward, southward, eastward, and westward. And twice... And God says, I am giving it to you, this land. In verse 15, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you. In verse 17, at the end, for I will give it to you. God's making this promise of the land to Abram. If I go back to that map, we have... Abram's at Bethel, 
Lot's already chosen the Kikar, this area over here, on a high mount in Bethel near it, only about a mile away. There's a peak where you can see totally up to the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, the Galilee area. And even further north, you can see what's called Mount Hermon, Big Mount. He could look northward. He could look southward. And southward, we have, um, well, Beersheba, the well of Sheba. We have Hebron. And he's looking south. He can see all that area from Bethel looking south. He can look west and see the Mediterranean Sea, all this plain area over here, which we call Philistia, the plain of the Philistines. And then he can also see eastward, even the same valley area. God says, I'm giving that all to you and to your descendants. And so he's looking and In verse 15, he says, this is the land that was given to him and his descendants forever. Forever? Does that mean today the land of what we call Palestine belongs to Israel? The answer is what? Yes. It was given to Abram and his descendants. And in verse 17, Abram was commanded to walk about the land. I want you to rise, walk through the land, its length and breadth. And although the text doesn't tell us that is exactly what he did, most likely that's exactly what he did. God promised him the land. And then God promised Abram numerous descendants. Three times he says, your descendants, your descendants. I say numerous because in verse 15, it says, I will give this land to you and to your descendants, or literally your seed. In verse 16, twice, I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. And if anyone can number the dust of the earth, that's what your descendants will be like. Numerous descendants. Abram was a man of faith. He believed God's promise, even though the land promise and this numerous descendants promise were not realized in his lifetime. As of this moment in time, Abram had no children. And yet there's going to be numerous descendants. And when Isaac comes along, he's got two sons. And the inheritance is going to go to Jacob. And when Jacob goes down to Egypt at the end of Genesis, he goes down with 70 people of his whole family. 70. And 400 years later, when they come out of Egypt, they are many, many thousands of people. They became a nation in Egypt. This is all pre-Abraham. I mean, Abraham didn't know any of this, but yet he believed God was giving them the land, and God was going to give him and make him into a great nation. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Abram had the conviction that what God promised, even though he did not see it, he knew it was going to come true. Faith. And the last verse tells us that Abram settled in Hebron. He moved his tent and he left Bethel and moved his tent southward and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Hebron's located about 25 miles south of Salem, which we call Jerusalem today. It's in the hill country of Judea. A year ago when I went on my Israel trip with Rabbi Kirk Glebe, we went through the hill country of Judea. You can see the road we traveled on. It's on the right, and it circles way around and climbs the hill. And bottom left shows you that I'm taking this from our van as it was tipping over the edge. No, it was (laughs) taking it out through the window. But that's a huge drop of land going down. 
That's called the hill country of Judea. Looks really pleasant, doesn't it? We're on our way to Hebron, the hill country of Judea. Hebron's known in Scripture as a primary biblical place. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all buried in Hebron in the cave of Machpelah. When Joshua brings the nation into the land of Canaan, he gives Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. He gives him Hebron. After Saul is killed by the Philistines, David was made king of Judah in Hebron, and he reigned there for seven years before the whole nation of Israel made him king. Hebron, major place. And it's here that Abraham chooses to dwell. And as soon as he sets up his tent in the Hebron, the first thing he does, he builds his third altar to the Lord. First one was in Shechem. Second one was in Bethel. Went back to Bethel and worshiped there at the altar. And now he's in Hebron and he builds an altar to the Lord. In other words, this is the place where I'm going to sacrifice to the Lord and I'm going to worship the Lord in Hebron. And as I started thinking about the passage and trying to put this all together, I'm, I came up with a very lengthy theme that this chapter is really a contrast between two men. One man named Lot lifted up his eyes and took that which would benefit him materially. He looked and said, this will benefit me materially. The other man, Abram, he was told to lift up his eyes and to receive from God that which would benefit him and his descendants spiritually for future generations. Both lifted up their eyes. One had a selfish look. The other had a forward-looking, I don't see how it's going to take place, but I believe. Look. And so as I want to wrap up this message, I think of some concluding questions. Are you a man or woman who identifies somewhat with lots? Are you aware of the dangers in pitching your tent near a Sodom? In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, Peter writes that Lot is a righteous man. He lived among the people of Sodom, and he felt his righteous soul tormented day after day. Lot's not heathen. He understood Yahweh. He understood about the Lord. The New Testament calls him a righteous man, but he's living among people who are very unrighteous, and his righteous soul was tormented every day. Ken Hughes wrote in his commentary on this passage, Dazzled by the prosperity of Sodom, Lot pitched his tent as far as Sodom. Lot was the kind of man who would certainly choose heaven over hell if given the choice but not heaven over earth. Material prosperity was the bottom line for Lot. He was the example of believers who choose professions for their children or encourage marriages that will elevate the family's prosperity and power with no thought of what it will do to their souls or the souls of their children. Lot's descendants testified to this as they became enemies of God's people. Lot became the father of the Moabites, and Lot became the father of the Ammonites, and they had their own gods. They did not worship Yahweh, the God of Israel. They worshiped their own gods, and they were enemies of the people of Israel. But that wasn't Lot. 
But Lot put himself in a place where the influence of the people around him affected his family. And what Ken Hughes is pointing out is how often do we focus on getting ahead in the world and we teach that to our children that it's important to get a great education, to get a great job in order to make something of yourself. And that becomes a priority in families. It's not what God wants. Maybe God wants you to be a poor missionary. You don't get ahead becoming a missionary. That can't be possible what Christianity is about, is going into other lands and telling people about Jesus and live poor. See, I think we have a little bit of lot in us, in our thinking, self-included. And I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle John, and I hope these penetrate your life today, because John writes in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, do not love the world nor the things in the world. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Doesn't apply to me because I love the things of this world. He goes on to say, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, how I can get what I desire, lust of the eyes, I need more, and the boastful pride of life, I want to be somebody. It's not from the Father, but that's from the world. And the world's passing away, and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. And as I read these words about don't love everything that we're not supposed to love. Your love is to be for the Lord God above, his son Jesus Christ, and to love your neighbor as yourself, and to love your fellow believer. That's our love. And we get caught up into the trap of a lot. We look with our eyes, we see what is good, how I can get ahead, and I want to get my family ahead, and I want to become prosperous, I want to be somebody. And we're choosing the wrong stuff. So, Pastor Bob, are you a man who identifies somewhat with a lot? And the answer is yes. Second question is, have have you fallen out of fellowship with God due to sin? Do you need a fresh start? See, this chapter opens up with Abram getting a fresh start. He failed miserably in Egypt. He didn't trust God to take care of him to protect him. He took matters into his own hands and said to his wife, may it go well with me. Have people think you're my sister. He puts her in danger. And God's the one who comes to his rescue. And God's the one who attacked Pharaoh with plagues. And he got him to the place where you need to come back into the land where you belong. And Pharaoh does expel him out of the land. And chapter 13 begins with him coming back into the land. And he journeys back to Bethel where he was setting up the altar previously and where he called upon the name of the Lord. And he comes back in faith and worships the Lord. He came back in verse 4 to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. He returned to the Lord in faith and he worshiped the Lord. And like Abram, we also can get off track. We also can have sin come back into our life. And we need to return to the Lord through repentance. What's repentance? Repentance really means a changing of a mind, which means change of direction. It starts with confession of sin and forsaking that sin and then returning in faith to following Jesus with your whole hearts. 
1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He, meaning God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But confession means you name sin for what it is in God's eyes. James Montgomery Boyce wrote in his commentary, The devil will tell us that we have sinned and can never go back to God. But God is the God of new beginnings. Someone has said that he is the God of the second chance. But Pastor Boyce wrote, but he is even more gracious than this. He is the God not merely of the second chance, but of the 72nd chance. And of the 172nd chance. Meaning God is always looking for his people to come back to him in repentance. How often do we get off track, ladies and gentlemen? How often? Lots. Maybe there's division in the church and you're part of that division. And you need to come back to God confessing that as sin. Trusting in Jesus Christ. Make it right with your brother and sister. Perhaps there's some kind of sin that nobody knows about it but you. But it stops your fellowship with God. You know it. God knows it. Do you need a fresh start? It's not too late to do something about it. God is a God that always gives fresh starts. Father, we come before you acknowledging the fact that as we look at this passage, many times we're like a lot. The things of this world matter so much. Sometimes we get involved in such worldly things that it's a detriment to our children who are raising. A detriment to the family. Lord, help us to be men and women like Abraham who are people who operate by faith. That when we do make mistakes, that we go back to worshiping you, that we go back to confessing of sin. And you give us a fresh start every time. So Lord, you know each person watching online. You know each person sitting in this room at this moment in time. You know this pastor. that we often get off track. I mean, when the Spirit of God convicts us of our sin, that we are quick to confess it and turn from it and walk in faith once again. So, Lord, you taught us through the Word. May each one of us act on it. We pray this in Christ Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen.